today I'm going to talk about um, continuing on that theme of uh, getting us a bit oriented. The land we're, we're probably fairly familiar with, all of us, right? ESRM majors and all that kind of stuff, chaparral, beaches, that kind of stuff. It's the underwater stuff and the faraway stuff in the ocean that's a little more foreign to us. That's why I'm spending a little more time on that uh, here in these intro lectures. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is how we, how we characterize and how we um, uh, describe different areas uh, in the ocean part of our world. So in particular, I want to give you guys some, uh, man some we'll, we'll be talking about in this lecture, some different geographies that will have value and utility for us doing um, engaged in management, various types of management activities. So we'll start with this video. Okay, so that's something we, we um, many of you guys weren't um, weren't uh, around or weren't uh, engaged when 9/11 happened, um, but that was you heard that all the time. Ah, oceans don't protect us anymore. Oceans don't protect us anymore. Oceans don't protect us anymore. As if they did, right? So that idea that oceans are some kind of barrier between us and the rest of the world really hadn't been in play for you know at least many decades if not longer than that and so i think that's that thinking is uh understandable but it's also very dated and doesn't speak to a lot of the real geographies that we need to deal with in terms of managing our our aquatic world and so i wanted to just um uh, start by saying that we oftentimes have somewhat different geographies certainly different terminologies for some of these places on land versus out at sea. Steven, you need a chair? No. Sure? OK. Yeah, you got one, you got one here if you want. OK. Um, OK, so uh, when we're talking about our terrestrial realm, here's some of the common things that we um, think about when we talk about our geographies. This is obviously the Los Angeles Basin, right? This is LA. Um, and in this case, we're seeing it all just through lights, just through our light pollution, right? But we can see just looking at the lights, that there's clear structure here, right? And when we talk about geography on land, we're often talking about a political, um, a very clear legal construct as to what is Disneyland, what is the freeway, what is your house, that kind of stuff, right? And this builds off of we are the fact that we're terrestrial critters, right? We grew up on land. So we have uh, customs, traditions, laws, all that kind of stuff that are really determining how we interact with our geography and determining the terms we use and, and our, our traditional approaches to stuff. Uh, here illustrated um, uh, by uh, San Buenaventura in 1877, right? Um, we could also use all kinds of other uh, definitions or jurisdictions to talk about our geographies of management on land. And so in this case, this is, these are our jurisdictional wetlands. These are, well, this is what should be the jurisdictional wetlands. The U.S. Supreme Court just changed the definition that we've used for the last 40 years. But suffice it to say, we still use this definition. And so this is um, where we have delineated according to a legal framework, not me, the ecologist, but the, the legally definable tripartite definition of a wetland. And, and the pink stuff here all represents um, an area of wetland, either a riparian wetland or other types of wetland here in Ventura County. We can also talk about other types of geographies that um, we um, derive from the natural world, just like wetlands, but then also um, we overlay some management issue on them. And so a, a great example of this are our wildlife corridors uh, here in Ventura County. You should be super proud. We are the first county in the US to have a wildlife corridor overlay. It was challenged profusely. So been going to meetings for about 15 years about this and a lot of folks were not 
how do I say this? A lot of vocal folks were not happy about this. It survived extensive legal challenges, and as of about a year ago, it's now the law, and it stood up to all kinds of attacks. And so this is a really robust tool, a planning tool, where uh, folks that are in unincorporated, in the green areas, in the unincorporated parts of Ventura County, uh, uh, where you want to do something, let's say you have a ranch or you have a house, you want to put up a fence, it's still okay to put up a fence, but it has to be wildlife permeable, meaning our mountain lions, our deer have to be able to sort of get through your property, right? Or if you have lights, instead of shining your light straight out, out into the fields or the river or whatever, the lights need to be pointed down at your driveway or at your porch or whatever. So various things that are not particularly onerous, I would suggest, but nevertheless, um, if you are in one of these green, green overlays, you have to pay attention to. And that's, again, a management geography that we've decided to do on land. Um, we have other more specific things related to the, co yeah, Stephen. Yes, I was in a meeting yesterday with our former state senator that helped uh, get money for it, with um, Caltrans, mm -hmm. with um, uh, the folks that have raised the $100 million to pay, for, the bulk of the $100 million to pay for it, um, with some other state representatives. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly in. Cutting. Oh, cool. Sweet. I love it. Cool. I love it. Uh, three of our students were working on that, uh, work, produce that, produce that ribbon yeah. cutting. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a fantastic success story. It's, it's, it, it's cost an insane amount of money. It shouldn't cost that much. It should have done it a long time ago. It should have been cheaper. But um, the fact that we're committed to doing connectivity in a fragmented landscape is awesome. And um, last year when I went to the P-22, uh, the famous uh, mountain lion from Griffith Park that was finally killed and was euthanized and sold out um, the uh, amphitheater in, in Hollywood Bowl. Um, uh, at the end of that, the head, and I said this last night at our, our meeting tour thing, um, the, uh, the head of Caltrans got up, the head of our road building agency got up and said how much he loves wildlife corridors and how committed they are to having more connectivity and, and less fragmentation with roads. And he started to cry. And I don't think it was an act. I don't think it was some kind of like, you know, looking for people. And, you know, as someone that came out of the era of the 80s and 90s when there was a massive battle to do conservation stuff um, in the context of Caltrans, and they planted all their invasive plants everywhere and all this kind of stuff, to see that level of a change in, and not that it's perfect and not that everything's, you know, 100% all the time are great, but, but that level of sentiment change and that level of commitment to having a different way of managing our resources in the coastal zone and elsewhere is really cool. And it is, it's, it's a significant change from the olden days as to how we thought we'd just pave everything over and screw it. Um, it really is uh, a different era. And the neat thing about our wildlife corridor is that, you know, it's going to be built, it's, it's being built, but, but it's also started a movement. And so now we have a, we're creating a fund so that other jurisdictions around the state that want to do this, that don't have famous actors and don't have famous celebrity critters, can still have access to some funds to work on having a more uh, less fragmented and more equitable um, uh, uh, movement across roadways. So that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I can talk for hours about that. So, so I'll be quiet because otherwise I'll talk for hours about that. Okay, great. So, this, so a different example of of uh, geography, and then uh, one that's a specific coastal zone. One is an, we, and so you make sure you write this down phonetically. Everybody pronounces this Esha, Esha. So like E S. HA, so ESHA, so it stands for Environmentally Sensitive Habitat Area. This is only within our, uh, the area that is managed by the Coastal Commission. And so as we talked about last time, it's, it's not a consistent distance inside versus, you know, it's, some of it's just very, very close to the coast, some of it's five miles in. But this is, th these are um, uh, communities such as maybe coastal sage scrub or other, or a wetland or other things that are um, sensitive and we want to give extra protection to in our planning concerns. So we talk about ESHA uh, areas. So, uh, so ESHA is defined through, in the Coastal Act and ESHA is defined as any area in which plant or animal life or their habitats are either rare or especially valuable because of their special nature 
or role in an ecosystem and which could be easily disturbed or degraded by a human activities or developments. Read putting in a house, read putting in a, a freeway, um, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's Esha. Okay, so that's all on land, right? That's stuff we're familiar with, that's stuff that, that should be, if you haven't seen some of those things before, it should be pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about what's going on in the ocean world. In the ocean, in the land, we have very specific legal frameworks. We have, you know, lawyers that specialize just in, not even just property, but in like rental property and, and rental property that subdivide, you know, very highly, highly specialized uh, case law and things of that nature. In the ocean, it's generally different. We have general legal constructs. And um, oftentimes nature-driven uh, concerns are what is driving our our interpretation of the ocean realm as opposed to much of the land. And so I'm gonna run through a couple of different examples. Oh, sorry, do you have a question, Ben? Oh, no, you're just stressed, okay. Uh, so a couple uh, different examples of how we can define uh, oceanic or marine areas. And none of these is right, none of these are wrong, it's just examples in different contexts with different communities or different management questions we might use one versus another. And so we'll talk about um, uh, how we can refer to the ocean by depth, how we can refer to the ocean um, by some things that came in from treaty, international treaties, a general location, and or by a basin. So this is an exaggerate. This is this is not um, an exact cross section of the ocean, but this is a nice uh, you know cartoon to illustrate the different areas. So when we talk about depth, let's talk about depth first. When we talk about depth. Um, uh, the area in the black is the part that's on land. The part that is either light blue to dark blue, that's all underwater. So we're, we're going down into the ocean. Um, most of our figures, when we do figures, an, an XY plot, generally speaking, down over here to the left would be um, you know, some measure of, of distance, let's say, you know, elevation or, or what have you. And we usually go from low to high but if you've watched my um, intro to marine science lecture, I, I emphasize this, um, we, we tend to do the reverse here. We tend to make the low up top and the high down low um, when it comes to depth. That just makes more intuitive sense for us. So as we go from the top of the page, we're shallow water. As we go to the you know, bottom part of the page, we're getting deeper in the ocean. So it makes more visual intuitive sense, but just want to point that out because sometimes people get a little tripped up. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about here, um, the, the um, left side of the figure here is referencing depth into the water. So the first little part, first part that's up in the black, that's the part that's in the air. That's the part that you and I see when we walk uh, along the coast. Okay, then we hit the water. Then we get into the continental shelf area, and this is um, a relatively shallow, um, uh, area that's around all of our um, continents. And then we hit an area that uh, it becomes that the angle changes significantly and we get uh, much more steep. It's not necessarily as steep as this shows, but nevertheless, it's a pretty consistent angle and, it, and the depth drops very fast. That's the continental slope. And then essentially that stuff that dribbles off that slope, erosion, stuff washes down, whatever, uh, earthquake knocks some stuff down, that stuff uh, piles up at the bottom or the toe of that area, and we refer to that as the continental rise, and then we hit the flat area, or the so-called abyssal plain, which is flat or basically flat, and this is the vast majority of the ocean bottom of the world is, is abyssal plain. Um, and, and most of the ocean is that. Every once in a while, we have some areas where that flat abyssal plane is punctuated by some different, uh, different structure. So one of them are, are deep sea trenches or oceanic trenches, which is a, a tear in the bottom. Uh, and then the other would be something like a, um, a mid-ocean ridge or, or a so-called ridge. And so that's where, uh, generally speaking, uh, plates are banging together and, and they're, they're lumping up on each other, or it's a high amount of volcanic activity and we're depositing material there, and it's essentially a, uh, a mountain range. And we sort of just did a cross-section through the mountain range, that submarine ridge. We also have 
uh, various so-called hotspots. Anyway, uh, the last one here is, is uh, we have these, uh, for reasons we don't fully understand, in our, our crusts, in our, in our plates that are covering the ocean, for some reason, some of these plate areas tend to have a thinner amount of material. And so it's easier for um, uh, magma, it's easier for lava to pop up, punch a hole through that thing. And we get that uh, manifested as volcanic islands. So whereas the volcanic island is like a thing, boink, you know, like, like, a, like a, a traffic cone kind of thing, the submarine ridge is a long, continuous uh, band that goes for, um, it stretches actually across the planet. But, but um, so there we go. So we have, so we can talk about the depth section. If we're talking about the bottom of the ocean, we're talking about the continental rise, the continental slope, excuse me, the continental shelf, the continental slope hits the rise, the rise then hits the abyssal plain. That's what most of the stuff is. And then the abyssal plain is punctuated here and there by sometimes a volcanic island, sometimes a, a, a mid ocean ridge, and sometimes a deep sea trench. I know between our islands, it's like 2,000 feet. So what would those be considered? Like our channel islands are actually a continuation of the Santa Monica, uh, of the geology that's the Santa Monica Mountains. And so they just sort of, the part that's underwater. Yeah, I guess I'll do this one slide, then we'll take a break, and I'll see if I can fix this uh, screen. So, um, okay, so, so that's just what I talked about. So we have our continents, which is what you and I are on right now, right? Our continents. The continental shelf um, has been, much of it has been exposed in the air at different times. So our sea level has risen and fallen over the last, you know, so the world ocean formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Um, and over that time, we've had sometimes lots of water, sometimes less water, various things have, have moved up and down. Either the, either the plate itself has moved and or the volume of water has shifted a bit. The point is that the continental shelf, um, for example, so, so uh, we were just asking about our uh, channel islands, right? So even though our channel islands have been separated from the mainland for a long, long, long time. Um, in the time when we had mammoths, woolly mammoths out there, say 10,000 years ago, um, the distance between the, the mainland and the island, instead of being the 17 miles that it is now, or depending on what point we're talking about, you know, a pretty good distance, some of it was even only maybe a half mile uh, separated. So, those mammoths still had to swim a little bit at some point, but it was a short swim as opposed to a swim that essentially nobody could do uh, today. Um, so the continental shelf, much of it was once exposed to air. Um, and the continental slope, um, it varies depending on where we are in the world. Uh, anywhere between 1 and 15 degrees, the average is about 4, which might not sound like a steep, you know, four degrees, a 4 degree slope might not sound pr pretty steep but it, it drops off pretty quick. It drops off pretty quick. If you, if you start walking on that sucker, you're gonna get deeper water um, pretty darn quick. Um, and, and again, like most of these things, when we're talking about these generic definite, these, in this lecture about you know, uh, the edge of continents and stuff, I'm using sort of generalities, right? But the reality, everybody should acknowledge that there, are, there is a great deal of heterogeneity, and depending on, depending on where we are on the Earth and, and in what situation it could be much less or much more than whatever that you know, generic number I'm giving you out uh, for a concept uh, illustration. Um, the continental rise is, is literally just like at the bottom of an eroding cliff you might see on PCH or something. It's just the, the, the puddled up stuff that's dribbled down from the top. Um, and the mid-oceanic uh, ridge system effectively runs around the globe. We'll talk about, I'll have some examples of that later. I like this. This is this is an East Coast example, but I, I just I've always sort of liked this uh, this cartoon. I thought it's just a nice um, uh, illustration of the shelf and slope. And so the purple stuff here is the Eastern Seaboard, is the East Coast, um, which right now is getting walloped by our most recent uh, Atlantic hurricane. And if anybody watched the um, if anybody watched the uh, Cowboy Giants game. It was great, the Cowboys crushed it, and one of your alums now works in New York for a, uh, for a um, uh, remediation company, and he's a big fan of the New York Giants, and so whenever they play, uh, we always go back and forth, and normally he says very snarky things, but it was such a bad game, 
He just said, can't say anything about that. And one of the reasons it was such a challenging game was because it was, this, it was a really, really rainy um, because of that uh, um, the, the, the outer bands of this hurricane that's blasting up there. And so you can see um, there's a lot of implications for uh, our management based on um, how thick our shelf is, right? So if we look down closer towards New Jersey, there's a relatively narrow uh, chunk of shelf, right? Whereas when we go up farther north, towards, more towards Canada, towards Nova Scotia, the shelf is much larger, right? That has implications for uh, uh, circulation, uh, current patterns, all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, I like this illustration because it, it does a, a fairly good job of showing that even though the four degrees might not seem particularly steep, it actually is pretty steep uh, relative to the scale of the geography we're talking about. Okay, so that was, that was a little bit about, about depth and, and how we can refer to the ocean uh, based on depth. The other, another way we can do this is by treaty. And so these are by political conventions that we've uh, entered into. Um, and a treaty, by definition, is with more than one country. So it could be between uh, our country and another country. It could be a multilateral treaty between many, many um, countries. And so you'll hear these terms. And these terms are all referring to essentially the same thing from a management context. And they're all going to be referring to... There it goes. I won't move. And so they're, they're all referring to um, the area that we are going to control, right? The area that our, um, our legal jurisdiction, our nation will control. Originally, um, the term people were using was, was territorial seas. Um, you might still see that, but not so much uh, anymore. Um, and I just say, so I just say most, of these, most of these things are referring to, if not the same exact thing, the same idea. And this is, again, projecting control over the oceanic realm from a terrestrial power. Um, so to, you hear the term territorial seas, you hear the term exclusive economic zone, or in common parlance, just like people say ESHA, they rarely spell out the whole word, they'll say ESHA. Um, in this case, people usually say EEZ is what they'll say in place of the whole term, the acronym. And so, uh, yep, exclusive economic zone. Um, we can also talk about the outer continental shelf um, uh, beyond three nautical miles. Recall three nautical miles is what uh, our state in the U.S., what the states control now in terms of under their uh, state jurisdiction. Um, and you also might hear extended continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. All the stuff re references um, areas out to sea. A lot of these things uh, are using a term that we rarely encounter these days. Um, and, uh, and it really only exists in this, in this sort of oceanic realm. But it's this notion of a so-called nautical mile. So because that's not really defined anywhere, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. It's essentially just a bit more than a mile. It's about 1.1 miles, so that's, that's the main thing you just need to know. It's a little teeny bit more than a mile. It comes from the fact that, we, that we're on a globe, and um, so much of our uh, trade has always moved across oceans, and so the importance of navigating oceans, etc. And originally, we defined nautical mile as one minute of latitude. Um, now we've more rigorously defined it as, um, if you want to do it in metric, it's uh, 1.852 kilometers um, or about 6,000 feet, um, and, and th that's how we get it. So unfortunately, to make it even more confusing, like kilometers, km, right, that's what we put, or, or um, uh, miles, mi, right? We have these standard units, f for Fahrenheit, et cetera. There is no single agreed upon term for nautical miles uh, in, um, in, across different jurisdictions. So it's, sometimes people will use M, sometimes they use NM, sometimes they use a lowercase N and a lowercase M and then lowercase I, sometimes NM, so it's, just, it's super confusing. So it's really weird. So pretty much we only will really see this when we're talking about things out at sea um, or, or some, some contentious issue about, uh, I want to do fishing here or something of that nature. And if you see anything that's capital M 
or or NM, it's it's probably going to be probably referencing nautical mile. Um, okay, so this is again this is a, a a rough rough idea, but when we were first going through this, when we were first crafting some of the um, this current thinking of of uh, exclusive economic zone, etc. In the wake of World War II, led by the U.S. because we were the dominant power in the world at the time, um, and uh, and and so we were interested in accessing resources. The resources we were interested in accessing: fish, and oil and gas, and to a lesser extent, deep sea mining. But that was really that was more of a conceptual thing at the time. And so while at that point, as we said, most of the people had just done stuff very close to their shoreline. Um, now with the increased technology and easier to get out, uh, both out distance from the shore and get down under the waves and do more things with greater technical prowess down deep, it became possible to, to consider that. And so, so um, in some places, 200 nautical miles is the continental slope. In some places, it's a continental rise. Um, but it, it, in some places, it's the abyssal plain. But the idea is it's going to encompass, in every case, the 200 nautical mile uh, distance, in every single case, is going to uh, cover the entirety of the continental shelf. That maybe doesn't so much matter in terms of oil and gas, but for fish, by far the most productive and diverse fisheries are on our coastal shelves. There are high sea fish, there are tunas and, and, and marlin and things of like that to be sure, uh, whales before that, um, but, but the vast majority of the stuff that we're eating is coming from um, uh, a continental shelf or shallower waters. So we, people wanted to grab that to make sure we had, we essentially controlled the um, uh, fishing resources. So, a question? Okay, cool. Um, and this, this is the same. This is the same illustration. Uh, just, I, I do want to say that um, this is a cartoon, right? So again, that continental shelf isn't going to necessarily go exactly to 200 nautical miles. It's going to go different distances. But you guys get the idea. Okay, put that all together, and this is what we have in terms of our geography. So the U.S. Um, uh, since we created the system, we created a system that works really well for us, right? Um, and, and so the 200 nautical miles are when we have something beyond 200 nautical miles. So the, the light gray there is all U.S. exclusive economic zone, right? Or so-called territorial waters, right? And so, and so all that is us. And so we created it because we don't have a lot of countries across the water from us, right? We're not like the Mediterranean. We're not like um, France or, or those countries where, where that we have another um, country right across from us. So we're like, yeah, we want to grab a whole bunch of stuff. Probably if we had that, we would not have argued for a 200 nautical mile grab because we would have wanted to get into other people's territory, right? So, so um, we did that. And then, and then obviously the um, parts that aren't um, Alaska or Hawaii or the US, those are our overseas territories, right? Most of which are in the Pacific, most of which were uh, acquired in, in World War II, right? Um, uh, not all, Philippines and stuff started before, but, but, but um, you guys get the idea. And so, so when you have an island in the middle of the ocean with nobody else around you, and you start to claim 200 nautical miles there, to it, you end up grabbing a huge chunk of the ocean. Um, in fact, uh, a place where we used to work uh, in the Cook Islands, that is the fourth largest EEZ in the world. And that's because it's a small island nation made of, of a necklace of little teeny tiny islands, but they're spaced far apart. And so when you draw the boundary around each of those islands, they, they actually grab a huge chunk of the ocean. Okay, so we can talk about exclusive economic zones. Okay, then we can talk about geographies of the ocean based on location. And so a couple different things here. I'll leave this up for a second, then I'll, I'll show you some exam. I'll show you a diagram that makes it make more sense. But um, one, we could talk about being near or far from the shoreline. 
we could talk about being in the water column, being in the middle of the, you know, surrounded by water on, on all sides versus being on or next to the bottom. So being near the bottom or being associated with the bottom, that is demersal. Something that's right on the bottom or actually inside the sediment, one or the other, that's bed thick. So they're both similar terms, but they mean slightly different things. So we have pelagic up in the water and then demersal or benthic as terms for things associated with the bottom. And before the stuff that's near the land, we talk about neuritic. And stuff that's far away, we talk about being oceanic. OK, um, um, the, re the next ones get a little bit uh, uh, complicated, so I'll just I'll show you in a diagram. But self-powered is uh, this is in reference to organisms. So is this organism self-powered? Um, in which case we'd call that um, nekton, N-E-K-T-O-N, or at the whim of currents, in which we would call that plankton or plankton. Um, and so those things are, are floating around with their movements primarily driven by self-powered is nekton, N-E-K-T-O-N. I have it in the next diagram. So nekton versus plankton. Um, we talk about being uh, uh, next to or far away from an edge, which is kind of what that neuritic oceanic is about. And we can also talk about being in the light versus in the dark, which is a big thing in most of the planet. So let me, let me show you what these things look like. Okay, so here we go. So here's another cartoon um, of our coastline. So the part that is in the air here is using this framework um, would be supra-tidal, so above the tides. That would be our, our beach, um, our uh, rocky intertidal, that kind of stuff. And then the stuff that is um, uh, associated near the coast is uh, littoral or littoral, littoral. Um, and we could talk about the benthic stuff is, are things, again, that are, that are on or, or in the bottom, in the sediments, or, or right next to the sediments. Stuff that's out in the water column, or, or excuse me, out, out away from any edge, it would be in the pelagic world. Ne <clears throat> excuse me, neuritic is right near the, the edge, right near the land. Oceanic is far away from the land. And then the area that is at least sometimes dry and at least sometimes wet, even if only for a little teeny period of the year, that would be our so-called intertidal, the between tide zone. <clears throat> Stuff that is always underwater, is never in the air, that's our subtidal. And the subtidal, we could, use, we could refer to all the rest of the ocean as subtidal. But generally speaking, we usually use that for the stuff that's um, you know, close to the land in a practical sense. And then we get these other terms um, that just mean deeper and deeper. Um, uh, abyssal, hadal is the really, really deep, deep, down, like Hades, right, going down to hell. Um, this is really, really deep stuff. Um, more important for our management stuff is this notion of photic versus aphotic. So photic is the chunk of the ocean where at least some photons are penetrating. So at least some photons from the sun are going through and making it down there. Um, the first one, the first level of that is the one where we can have net positive photosynthesis. So where our phytoplankton, where our giant kelp, where whatever could maintain a net positive um, carbon balance. And so they could actually be you know, feeding off that energy from the sun. Even though when, when we're in an area where, where photosynthetic organisms can't make all their, their um, energetic requirements from being in the sun, they, they still might be able to see stuff. There still might be light. So that's still the photic zone. The aphotic zone means there is no light derived from the sun. The aphotic zone is not pitch black, though. So the aphotic zone, the light that's there, there's a lot of light but it's coming from living organ primarily living organisms. It could be a glowing volcano, I suppose, like in a Disneyland tour or something. But, but mostly, it's coming from um, signaling from critters, lures from critters, um, 
uh, uh, mating um, flashes from critters. And so it's all life-derived light. So the A photic zone is referring to no light from the sun. Okay? And then the critter, so, and so this, this would be for uh, like the structure of the ocean, like the physical stuff or, or, the, or, the, or where the probe is or where the ship is or something like that. Then when we talk about living things, um, there's a couple different terms we can use here. So I mentioned before the plankton and the nekton, those are critters that are in the water column. Okay? So those are critters that are moving around. And uh, if they're primarily being moved by the currents, they're plankton, either zooplankton or phytoplankton. Phytoplankton uh, meaning a photosynthetic critter, zooplankton meaning a critter that's going to cons consume another critter for their energy. So plankton or nekton. Nekton would be a shark. Nekton would be a whale, a tuna. So something that, that's moving through the water column the way that the critter wants to move, right? So they might get some benefit from the current, but they can go wherever they want, whereas plankton are primarily driven by where the currents are taking them. Okay, and then things that are associated with the bottom, and that could be, uh, those are benthic critters or, or, or benthos. Um, and then uh, critters that are floating right at the surface, right at the skim, the interface where the air and the water meet, those are neustons. So those are like plankton, but they're, they're right tight up at the, at the skin of the ocean. So we have neuston, plankton, nekton, and benthos or benthic critters. Cool? Questions? Straightforward? Okay. And then lastly here, we can talk about basins. So we can talk about um, uh, the different uh, bowls of the ocean. It's important for me to say here, I should have put a slide in here. I, I need to add a slide here, that we have one world ocean, right? One ocean. So our water, our movement stuff, stuff is eventually, this stuff's all connected, right? The 71% the of the surface of the earth that is covered by water, that's all one giant world ocean. We in human history love to carve this up with different names, different terminologies, different territorials, uh, terms and all that kind of stuff. But, but basically we have one big ocean. Having said that, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the basins are, are, are a chunk of that world ocean that tend to behave more like itself than the other basins. And so there's some, some value in talking about the basins for trade, for climate change, for things of that nature. And so let's talk about the five major basins uh, uh, on the, in the world. The first one is ours, the largest, the, the biggest, and the deepest. That's the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific, or the Pacific Ocean Basin. The next largest one is the Atlantic. Uh, then we have the Indian Ocean. The, while, while both the um, Pacific and Atlantic span the entirety of the um, uh, north to south of our planet, the Indian Ocean is primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and then after the, those three major ocean basins, then we have a basin that might not look like a basin, but that's the Antarctic Ocean. And even though it's not as uh, separated by continents as, uh, or as contained by continents as the previous three we just mentioned, um, because of the way water moves around, air moves around, in, in a sense it really functions as, a, as something of its own basin. And I'll show you uh, in, uh, the key feature of that in a little bit. Um, but uh, it's really defined by the so-called uh, Antarctic Convergence, which is um, um, a, a separation of water masses um, between the Indian Atlantic and Pacific versus the southern area of um, Antarctica. Now, with Antarctica, there is the continent there. So we're talking about the water that's, that's around the perimeter of this landmass. The last basin, the Arctic Ocean Basin, is the, the shallowest and the smallest in terms of, uh, you know, two-dimensional aerial extent. Um, but it actually is the whole mass of the north, right? So we think of that as being covered by ice, which it is, but climate change is doing its best to eliminate all that. We are trying to eliminate ice there, it seems like. Um, but so, so the Antarctic has a continent in the bottom, and the, and the Antarctic Basin surrounds that. The Arctic, it's the whole North Pole uh, region up there. Okay. 
Um, and while uh, those are the basins, those are the five major basins, I'll just say that in practice, because um, the, um, these areas are so big, we sometimes, you will fairly frequently hear terms and these aren't hard and fast terms, but they're terms for the regions that you might hear uh, in political debates or something about shipping or, or fisheries stuff. And so people will talk about the North Pacific. For the North Pacific, we're talking about stuff basically off of Japan, off of the US and Canada um, and Mexico. That would be the North Pacific. The South Pacific would basically be sort of lower South America to Australia. And then you will fairly frequently hear the Pacific for the, the middle part, the part around the tropics, um, broken into the Eastern and Western um, Pacific. And that's what we're referring to. So generally when somebody says Eastern Pacific, they're generally meaning this area here. They're generally not meaning up, you know, the Eastern side of, you know, this part here by where Alaska is kind of thing. Um, and then same thing with, um, the Indian Ocean, we talk about the tropical Indian Ocean, which is the area right up, uh, you know, abutting Asia. And then the southern Indian Ocean, which is the part that's going to be right up against the Antarctic Convergence. And the same with the Atlantic. We have the North Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic, and the South Atlantic. Um, we don't, you don't routinely hear the Western and Eastern as much in the Atlantic because it is a smaller basin. Cool? All right. So uh, important for me to emphasize here because I'm showing you cartoons. So this is um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, just to make here for me to remind you or for, remind me to tell you that even though I'm using the term basins, it's not a bathtub, right? It's a, it's a, it's a contained area, but it's not like a perfectly machined ceramic bowl that you're eating cereal out of, right? There's all kinds of... Um, heterogeneity uh, built into that structure. Okay, and then just a, a little bit on uh, position and location. I know you guys have all taken GIS or, or will soon be taking GIS, but just so we're on the same page. Um, we, the other way we can talk about geography is to just simply say where we are on the surface of this sphere or slightly squished orange is a better descriptor of our surface of our planet. And so there we obviously use Latin lawn, right? And so um, latitude is, are, is the, re represents the degrees from um, the equator uh, towards the poles. And longitude is the, the degrees away from a, a central meridian, what we call the prime meridian. And the prime meridian goes through Greenwich, England, because England was a big power back then and just picked it. There's no magical reason why. The, the equator sort of makes sense that why the prime meridian is where it is is just by convention. And so uh, latitude, so, so our different um, bands of latitude are always the same distance apart. However, um, with longitude, it depends on where we are. And so uh, as you guys probably all know, um, where we are, uh, for our part of the world here in California, um, when we refer to where we are, we're using a positive convention. And then if we were in the Southern Hemisphere, we'd use a, a minus, again, purely by convention. There's, that's not, that doesn't mean good, bad. It's just how we des designate stuff. And then being west of the prime meridian is um, negative, and being east of the prime meridian is positive. So that means for us, right here, our campus, um, in, we used to traditionally use something like degrees, minutes, seconds. Now, pretty much because everybody uses Google and, and ArcGIS, pretty much everybody has gone to decimal degrees, um, which is way easier when we're talking about um, transferring files and copy and paste and all that kind of good stuff. So in decimal degrees, we are, where you guys are sitting right now in, in, in Sierra Hall, um, you're 34.161343 um, uh, degrees north latitude and minus 119.0.0445 uh, degrees um, as far as longitude. So cool. So we, we could also use that very specific geography of where we are in space. Uh, questions about that so far? Everything makes sense? Okay. So the last thing here I just wanted to go over were um, some uh, key geographies 
that are things that I think many of you maybe haven't seen before or haven't thought about. So there are other things beyond this. I'm going to ask you guys at the end of this for you guys to give me some ideas of, of things that, that uh, we've encountered. But suffice to say, these are um, things that have significant um, consequences for uh, usually many different management challenges. Um, and so let's just run through. Uh, this is just a smattering to, to illustrate some things that maybe you guys haven't seen before. So the first is the Great Barrier Reef. This is the largest biogenic structure on Earth. So the largest thing made by life, that you, single thing that you could see. Um, this consists of this chunk of northeastern, um, uh, the waters off of northeastern Australia. And it's the, it is about 900 individual islands, about 300 coral caves, sort of sandy, sandy islands and about a, more than 150 inshore mangrove islands, so, so things that are accumulating a bit more um, um, silty type sediments um, and are stabilized by woody vegetation. 25% of all macroscopic, so it's important to say here, I'm not talking about the microbes, right? But for the macroscopic uh, marine species that we've identified, fish, coral, snails, algae, that kind of stuff, 25% of all known marine species um, exist uh, in the, can be found in the Great Barrier Reef. And so that's on the order of um, uh, about 3,000 subtidal reefs. Um, some, are real, some are like the size of this room, some are like the size of campus, some are the size of multiple campuses, right? So th they're, they're highly variable. Um, uh, something like uh, 1,625 fish species, which is 10% of all known um, fish species, about 600 species of coral, and it just goes on. And there's all kinds of superlatives we could put in there, but it's a pretty crazy place. Um, it's a World Heritage Site. Apparently, it's so important I put that twice. <laughs> I don't know why I put that twice. That was lame. Um, and uh, it generates something on the order of about $6.4 billion to the Australian economy per year from tourism, from, from fish stocks that are harvested there, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and in recent years, it's been experiencing repeated, as many of our coral communities have across the planet, repeated bleaching events, where because of thermal stress, uh, pollution stress, uh, other things, the coral toss out their symbiotic zooxanthellae and, and many times die, they don't always die, um, but, uh, but it's, it's a big problem, right? And, and this is leading to loss of coral and coral diversity all across the planet. The place that I visited two weeks ago um, looked pretty healthy, even though it was a very uh, heavily frequented tourist spot, looked pretty healthy. The change was that, whereas maybe, let's say, 15, 20 years ago, if we went there, we would have seen a, lot, a high diversity of coral, erect coral like my hand sticking up or, or deer antlers or things of that type of type of coral. Now you mostly see uh, massive corals. So, so the spreading corals, the big lumpy corals. So the percent cover of coral is still pretty high, but the diversity has changed. And so um, uh, anyway, so that, that's the Great Barrier Reef. This is what it looks like. It's really, really cool. Um, what one small section looks like this. Um, really beautiful place. I would encourage you guys to all get out there if you can. Um, uh, really neat area. And of course, all kinds of challenges to shipping uh, because it's difficult to navigate. It's easy to get you know, wreck and crash and stuff. Um, and super important for productivity. Super important for breaking up storms before it gets to the mainland. Um, on and on and on. When the, I will post a, uh, later I will post a um, podcast for you. Uh, but uh, when this was established, so, so, so this was originally threatened um, when I was a little kid, uh, well, I guess before I was born, then I was a little kid, and the interest was we should go in and carve all that stuff up to get, um, take the calcium carbonate skeletons and then send it to Asia to be ground up to use in concrete, right? Like, brilliant idea. What a fantastic thing to do. That was defeated, and as we defeat that, uh, the next thing is like, okay, what we meant to say is we're actually going to do oil and gas drilling in there. And then that was essentially defeated, but it's still sort of an ongoing battle. But, but um, so the point being, uh, all kinds of coastal management interests here that we have to uh, deal with. 
Next one you might not have heard about, coral triangle. Has, has, anybody, not, has anybody not heard of the coral triangle? Just out of curiosity. A few people haven't. Okay, cool. That's fine. That's cool. I presume everybody had heard of Great Barrier Reef, right? Yeah, that's very good. Okay, so the coral triangle is um, one of these areas that frustrates uh, most of my biodiversity colleagues because one of the main things that, that a certain subset of ecologists try to do is predict diversity around the world. Why do we have more critters on this chunk of land and that chunk of land? Is it rainfall? Is it heat? Is it fertilizer? You know, what's going on? And this has been one that has stumped people for a long time. So when we talk about marine diversity, coral, fish, things like that, the epicenter is in the coral triangle. So note this is like, this is right next to the, right, right next to the um, Great Barrier Reef, right? So we're in that same vicinity. But this area that spans these six countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Timor, uh, and the Solomons, that this area in, in the cartoon right here, um, uh, hugely important. So it's only about one percent, about one and a half percent of all the surface area of all the world's ocean, but we have one third of all the coral reefs in the world are here. And 76% of all the coral species in the world are here. And so it's a hard one to explain. So, so, so Wallace, the, the, the um, uh, colleague of Darwin, right? Darwin rushed to publish Origin of the Species because Wallace was out here doing work in this incredibly diverse area. And he basically was figuring out the theory of evolution by himself. And he sent some notes to Darwin. And Darwin's like, oh, damn, better publish this first. Otherwise, this guy's going to beat me to it. So tremendous diversity here, both on land and in the ocean, but, but um, particularly in the marine realm. So the coral triangle, really, really important. Here, um, in addition to all those other things we talked about, here most of the biodiversity is directly playing into the food and the daily lives of the people that live here, right? Much more so than in some other areas. So if we have crappy fisheries here, if we have sick and dying reefs, that's going to lead to a degraded quality of life for the, for the uh, residents of these communities. Okay, another one, probably everybody's heard of the Marianas Trench, right? Yes? Okay, so this is the deep, so the Marianas Trench, so this is the Marianas Islands, or the Mariana Archipelago, this chunk right here. And so um, we can see here as we've, as we've drained the sea, you can see some of the benthic topography here. You can see that there's this, this ridge that's extending down from Japan. Um, and then on this right-hand side of the ridge is this rent. Is this, in, this, in this graphic, it looks dark. It's because it's deeper, right? And so this, this Marianas Trench is a big thing. And uh, at the deepest deep part, which is called the Challenger Deep, that's the deepest place in the planet, or that, that's the deepest point of the ocean that we know of. It's so deep that if we took Mount Everest and chopped off Mount Everest somehow magically, and then threw it down in here, it would still be about 2,000 feet or so below the surface of the ocean. So it's really, really deep. Um, so this is like, uh, you know, this is like crazy bottom of the earth. And, and, and we first went there, um, BB in the bath escape, we went there in the 60s, super cool. It took us decades to get back, right? Uh, and a fantastic read. If you guys ever want to read about that, talk about like scary reading and, and adventure reading, that's crazy stuff, right? Um, they were going down in essentially a metal sphere, the bath escape, the bathysphere they made. And as they're halfway down, they heard a big tong. And they're like, should we keep going down? And they're like, hell yeah. And so they kept going down. Um, but I mean, crazy stuff. So um, uh, only in recent years have we really returned, including robotic instruments. The pressure is so great, even when the Japanese are some of our master roboticists on the planet, they had an extremely hard time getting the robots down to the, to the uh, deepest parts of the trench. It just, the pressure was just crazy. So the Marianas Trench is really key and really interesting. Um, not so much for direct um, resources that we benefit from, but definitely in terms of testing technologies and things of that nature. Another important one, um, is, is anybody not heard of the Drake's Passage? A few people haven't? Okay. Okay, so this is um, the stormiest part of the ocean. 
So just like you might want to test your, your robot to go to space or whatever under crazy pressure conditions or whatever, like being on Venus or something, you can go to the Mariana's Trench. You could, if you want to test anything that's going to be seaworthy, if it can survive in the Drake Passage, it can survive anywhere else on the planet. So what we mean by the Drake's Passage is it's named, um, so a Spanish explorer first saw it and in Spanish maps, uh, they might use a different term for this, but everybody else around the planet uses the Drake's Passage and, and, and named after Sir Francis Drake, who was the first English speaking uh, person to, to go through this in his ship, the Golden Hind. His two other ships are, don't make it, but his one ship makes it. Uh, in any event, we're talking about the area between the tip of South America and as uh, the southern tip of South America and the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. The Antarctic, Antarctic continent is like a comma. So the main continent is sort of a circular area. And then we have this one little chunk that juts up, the so-called Antarctic Peninsula. And that little chunk of water in between is the Drake's Passage. The geography, in this case, the, the physical geography is dictating what's going on and leading to all kinds of management challenges, primarily in the context of shipping. So it's really, really hard to get through here. And so um, this is the, this part right here on our planet is the only, the, Linda was just here, did she bring in a globe? She did not bring in a globe. I saw her carrying a globe earlier. Well, anyway, next time you have a globe, if you spin the globe and just randomly stick your finger on that globe, you're gonna, and the globe is spinning, you might first stick your finger on what would be the ocean. Very quickly, you're gonna bump into a continent, right? It's gonna spin around, you're gonna hit, I don't know, uh, Asia or hit, you know, Africa or something, right? The only spot on the globe that if you jam your finger, you're only going to hit water is between the, is the Drake Passage. So it's the only place that winds that are blowing straight east or straight west can become insane. And this is why the oceans are so incredibly dangerous there and so hard to navigate because there is essentially infinite fetch, right? So fetch is the amount of the distance that the wind is moving over the water and therefore creating drag and therefore creating waves, wind-driven waves. And so you can imagine if I have my little like drink cup here and I blow into it and I have a little bit of waves, but if I had that same level of blowing but over a table where you guys are sitting, we get much you know, higher waves. And if we could do that same thing you know, over the planet, it would get even crazier. So pretty consistent. 40 foot waves. When I used to go through here, we would sometimes get like 60 foot waves or 70 foot waves, which is, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to describe what that is. That's a, that's a, and by a wave, I mean like up, down, up, down, like nonstop for like, you know, days on end, up, down, not like an occasional random kind of splash. Um, so it's very, very difficult to navigate. And to this day, many, many vessels break up and, and uh, don't survive. What that also is doing, that, that movement of wind, is also influencing the current. And so that's why we have this term of the Antarctic Basin, right? That in effect, it's creating its own weather pattern, oceanic atmospheric circulation, that's essentially, for different times of the year, is cutting off Antarctica from the rest of uh, the water mass or the rest of the air mass. This is why we have the... Um, the, uh, the ozone so-called hole problem, it's not technically a hole, it's a thinning of the ozone, but the reason we have that problem is because of this. Because the, the ozone depleting chemicals that we were releasing from our aerosols and other things were all around the planet. But because of this, because of the Drake's passage and because of this, this segmenting off of this chunk of our planet from the rest of the planet, in the Antarctic winter and the austral winter, this stuff would build up and build up and build up. And it turns out it actually would accumulate on the edges of clouds, of ice clouds. And then when we hit the austral spring and the sun would hit it, these UV lights would hit these compounds, break off the chlorine. The chlorine would be highly active and highly reactive. And then it would attack the ozone and we'd have a massive depletion. So, you know, an incredible, a, a world threatening. Um, a challenge was coming because of our pollution that was mediated by this physical geography. So that's a Drake passage. Another one that you might, maybe you've heard of this, but this is the, I mentioned before, the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. This is really a giant 
more or less contiguous mountain range that's going to spill around most of the planet. The whole thing, the, the vast majority of it is underwater. There are a few chunks that kind of come shallow and, and make a, an island or, or terrestrial part of, part of a continent. But most of this stuff is underwater. Most of it is also fairly deep. So the depth is, the average depth is on the order of about two, two and a half kilometers down. So it's mostly a deep, uh, uh, it, it, would be, it would be the thing everybody and their brother would want to climb if it was on land, right? But because we, it's underwater, we tend to not see it, so we forget about it. And it is by far our most extensive mountain range uh, on Earth. Another one that you guys probably all have heard about is, it was the great, is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is created by the geography of our ocean basins and the circulation of water, the currents that are moving around in these ocean basins. And so these are the uh, five main gyres that are going to correspond mostly to those basins that we talked about before. Indian Gyre, South Pacific Gyre, North Pacific Gyre, North Atlantic Gyre, South Atlantic Gyre. There are other subgroups and stuff, but these are the big sort of large scale patterns. And the one that got the most attention is this North Pacific one here, which is uh, uh, this area that is um, particularly this sort of uh, light uh, fogged colored area right here. Um, this is really where, um, uh, because um, these, these currents are circulating, because we're jettisoning things from our uh, vessels and from our continents, uh, this was essentially acting as a hydrological discontinuity, as a acting as a place where things could uh, accumulate. It's been growing since at least the 1980s, at least, most assuredly before then, but at least since the 1980s. It was first really quantified in 1997, where folks went out to actually measure stuff. And, and Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Um, it's from the oh, great question. So in today's, with today's technology, we have really good... Um, satellite imagery, both in terms of like, you know, the clouds and stuff, as well as um, oceanographic buoys to actually look at the currents and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, you would um, definitely make sure you were okay going into it. Um, and if it was a real, a particularly crazy time, you would probably pause, hold off. There are other ways. You you can come up here, and there are some passages up. Uh, near Terra del Fuego, you can go um, in the Straits of Magellan, um, depending on what kind of vessel you have. Uh, but generally speaking, you'd probably just wait a little bit for that storm system to pass or what have you. Um, when I was th but when I was there, um, um, I used to go there in the early 90s, early mid 90s. And I remember one time I was on the bridge of our vessel and we listened to a, a boat, um, a bunch of people die, um, which was a cargo vessel and they um, got caught in uh, horrible weather and um, like whiteout conditions where you couldn't see anything. And um, I'd say if, if you were in a, a big, robust, giant cargo vessel these days, you're probably cool. Um, but not every cargo vessel is robust and cool and well-maintained. In fact, um, something we'll talk about later, hopefully, if we get to it this semester, is this idea of what our international shipping has become. And a lot of our international shipping, so back in the day, things were flagged, China, Great Britain, US, France, Mozambique, whatever, right? Um, now, most of our international, not most, I should be careful to say that. Many of our international vessels are what are known as flags of convenience. So they're, so they're, they're flagged with Liberian flags and these other places where they have uh, lower fees and less stringent safety checks. And indeed, what we see frequently, particularly with black markets and piracy and things of that nature, we see the vessels, uh, a shell company versus a sh within a shell company, within a shell company, within a shell company, within a shell company. And so the, a vessel will go into port and it'll be named the Susanna or something. And then at night, they go buy some paint, offload some stuff. And then they kind of go out to sea and they kind of stop for a little bit. They paint out Susanna and they paint a different name on it, put a different transponder on or something of that nature. And so, um, so uh, folks that are doing that kind of stuff, they're going to run their vessels till they're essentially falling apart. And so what you'll see is people will be painting over the vet like rust. Like if you and I had a vessel that's rust, we're like, oh my God, let's grind this rust down. 
let's clean it up, let's seal it, let's fix it, right? But um, some uh, less safety conscious, <laughs> shall we say, uh, actors will do that kind of stuff. Those kind of vessels um, are the ones that break up in the Drake Passage, right? That are not well maintained, that are kind of, they should have been retired 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they're still running it. And um, the other challenge is many of our crews on these international ships are, um, uh, are uh, the, 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 the captain and the officers are from one country, and the folks that are doing the grunt work are from another country. And many of those countries, like the Philippines and others, don't necessarily have a tradition of sailing in Arctic waters. And so when you get to these situations, it's even that much more complicated because they might not have uh, all the safety training personally to survive uh, these things. So, yeah. Oh, so it's going to depend. So great question. So the, one of the questions, and we'll talk about that in, in a sec. So one of the questions is, um, why would you do this? Back in the day, everybody had to, right? I mean, it was either this or go the other way around the world. So that's how to do and then um, in 1914, we opened up the Panama Canal. I say we because that's a whole other story, right? We Americans went in and, and created this country called Panama, and then Teddy Roosevelt said we should have it for ourselves, and all, these, all this imperialist stuff that happened. But, but um, as far as the conversation here, we dug a canal across the middle part of Central America so that you could avoid this. One, you could avoid the danger, but two, you could also avoid the time. Now, primarily, it has to do with the size of the vessel. So the Panama Canal is only so big that we just expanded it again. But it's only, you can only take vessels that are you know, size X. And so if it's bigger than that, some of these big giant super tankers, you have to, either you have to go around or you have to offload your cargo in wherever and then drive it across land and then take it across. So, so this is still for a lot big bulky things. If you want to go across, that's how you go across. Or in the case of us, stuff coming from Asia, that's why the port of LA Long Beach is the largest container port in the US because we get all the stuff that comes to us and then we put it on trucks or trains and it goes to you know, our friends in New York or New Mexico or whatever, so. All right. Oh yeah, no, no the, the, you do, you do. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty great. Like, when, like one of the best, one of the times I went down, um, there was a boat full of people, uh, the scientists, but um, a bunch of people. And then because I tell you, they always make me stay in the bow cabin, a holes. Um, so, uh, so I couldn't stay in my cabin, and so I was in the TV room watching TV most of the time because you can't do work, right? We try to do work, but it's like things just like fly off, so you can't really do anything. And so I was there, and it was like, oh, and I'd go to have breakfast or lunch with the crew, and it was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm talking, I'm, I, I, should, I should save these stories for later when it's not in the middle of lecture, but, but so um, anyway, uh, and then we get to where we're going, which is down over here, and, uh, and then all of a sudden there's like 50 more people on the boat. And I was like, what the hell? Like, where were you guys last like five days? And they were all like deathly ill, like in their cabin, being motion sick. Um, so you can go as a tourist. I don't know if that's the most fun experience <laughs> as a tourist because uh, everybody gets seasick. They're like people that are macho or whatever, everybody gets seasick. It's just a matter of how soon you get seasick. Where was I? Uh, did, I did I get to everybody's questions? Okay, so then uh, garbage patch. So this is, again, a geography that we've created. There would be crap out here if it wasn't for us. There would be palm fronds and coconut husks and stuff. But obviously, the stuff that we've generated and the most conspicuous thing here are the plastics. Um, and most of them are buoyant, so they're going to float, so they're going to be disproportionately likely to be accumulated here. Um, and they're concentrated. Now we hear the, the uh, do I have a picture? No. Uh, so the, the, the garbage patch, and we tend to think of this. And these are the pictures that make it into the newspaper articles and stuff, and that's a dramatic picture, right? It's not all like that. So just to be clear. The area, we, you know, it depends on, it's a huge superlative thing. So people say it's like the size of two Texases or the size of France or whatever, right? It's a large area where we have this high concentration of plastics, microplastics, macroplastics, et cetera. But it's not like this. It's more like 
snow. It's more like stuff that you encounter much more frequently than we were if we're in other parts of the ocean, but it's not like it's seven inches thick across the ocean surface for the state of Texas. Um, so it is a problem, it is real, but it's, it's not maybe the way some people conceptualize it. Do you know how deep down in the water column It's relatively shallow, relatively shallow. So, um, so the, most of the folks that are going out there and doing sampling are sampling with nets or, or snorkeling or, you know, like so, so, so within, I'd say that definitely within the top 10 meters, most of it probably within the top like three meters. Cool. Okay. Uh, next is, I want to another really important geography that maybe you guys have not thought about are shipping channels. And while the visualization below are, are major shipping um, routes, uh, uh, we could talk about all shipping channels, but, but in particular, I'll say five that are probably the most important from a management perspective across the planet. One is the Strait of Hormuz, which um, people familiar with that? Anybody familiar with that? No. No. Okay. So, um, so where you will hear this mostly is related to the Middle East and related to oil. So this is where a, a disproportionately large chunk of our oil and gas that's coming from the Middle East is going to pass this area. This is in the Gulf of Oman. And, um, and it's very narrow. So right now, the US, I can't remember what it is, Fifth Fleet, whatever fleet it is, we have US warships stationed right here because you know a few, a few months ago, some Iranian groups went to take out, a, went to basically capture an oil tanker. And so this is a sort of a constant ongoing thing, um, which is uh, 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 say it's very easy to attack, either to capture or to damage or destroy shipping traffic going through the Strait of Hormuz. It's a sort of, you gotta, you gotta make a big turn and you're kind of slow moving vessels. It's mostly the stuff that's here is gonna, a lot of this is gonna be oil and gas. So it's very valuable, very potentially flammable stuff. So it's really dangerous. Um, and that's the, that's the Strait of Hormuz. And this is where right here, right up in here, right in the Middle, uh, middle East. Um, we can next talk about the Suez Canal. All right, the Suez Canal is right over here. Um, the Suez Canal was completed in 1869, which is insane to think of folks building this massive, I mean, they've expanded it since then, but, but the first uh, canal that was dug um, in the mid 1800s. It went 100. It goes 193 kilometers across the Egyptian um, across Egypt, and is the is a key route. It's the shortest route if we're going from Europe to Asia or Asia to Europe. Um, and it handles something like 12 percent of all the global trade in the world, so a huge proportion. Um, and if folks will remember, I'll probably put some readings in here. Yeah, Jake. That's the one the ship got. Yes, exactly. So I'll probably have some readings on that later. But um, it's called the Ever Given that Jake's referring to. This was, if you guys remember, during the pandemic or towards the end of the pandemic, the ship was going down and then, for a series of reasons we won't talk about right now, uh, basically ran into the side of the canal and then tried to get themselves out and then just got themselves more stuck. And then it just blocked it up. So it sucked, it caused all kinds of problems, but it actually gave us, just like the pandemic, it gave us an interesting test that we otherwise would not have been able to do. And so from that, what we know is $9.6 billion of trade each day go through, the, go through the Suez Canal. So when that sucker was in there blocking it, it was a lot of people. Not only could people not get their sneakers and shoes and stuff, but also just the, the economic impact was tremendous. Um, uh, the Suez Canal, I couldn't get, I couldn't get numbers for um, the Straits of Hormuz, but for the Suez Canal, it's about 70 ships a day. These, but these are massive tankers, right? So this is, this is a large, it's a large number of vessels. Okay, next one is the Panama Canal, which you guys probably all know where that is. That's, we already mentioned that, that's right down here, carved uh, uh, across the um, Isthmus of Panama. Um, that was formally open again, just like the Suez Canal. It's been expanded since then, but it was first connected in 1914. Uh, there are three major locks, and um, that takes about 40 ships per day um, through uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, both the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal were, were novel 
ecological uh, experiments and led to biological invasions. So in both cases, in both cases, right, we had bodies of water, say, in the Caribbean and the Pacific um, that had not had those critters exchanged. But now we have seawater going back and forth. You can get the larvae and get individuals. And so we saw um, lots of critters make the, essentially the land jump from this one chunk of an ocean to another chunk of an ocean because of these um, uh, canals. And we, now, we actually have terms for this now. Um, uh, Straits of Malacca, which is right over here, um, is the shortest route between uh, the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And um, it's the second busiest waterway in the world. Um, and that takes about, that has on the order about 230 ships a day traverse that area. And then lastly, the English Channel, which you guys probably all know about. We're talking about the southern, the southern, the water south of the island of Great Britain. Um, and that uh, connects the North Sea to the Atlantic. And that takes about 500 ships a day through that passage. So these are relatively small chunks of land, small chunks of our planet, right? But because there are key pinch points for international trade, things that happen there, a storm, a political uh, thing, a, a, a war, um, can have huge ramifications. Izzy. Um, so you mentioned with like, at least with Panama, they're sharing like water that was never originally shared. Has this caused problems in terms of biodiversity? Yep. Uh, ecologically, it's a negative, no question. Um, so mostly, it's it's not in the sense of improving biodiversity. It's mostly in the sense of introducing invasive species. Not every single species is invasive, but um, yeah, problems, uh, seaweeds and things that would that were not present, were able to get to those spots. I mean, shipping in general does this. So even even outside of these these canals, just the fact that we're the classic thing is ballast water. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'll save that for later. We're talking about because we'll, we'll go into that later. But um, but but the vessel can transport individuals as well as the waterway can be transporting individuals. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Um, another one. Uh, if you guys, you, hopefully, you guys have heard of dead zones. Okay. So um, there's uh, the most famous one is uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, but but these are all areas of low oxygen. Okay, uh, they can be generated from a couple different ways, but primarily it's because of our terrestrial-based management that leads to runoff, that leads to algal blooms and 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 the like, and reduces uh, oxygen in the water. Um, and that's coming from like increased nutri increased eutrophication and things of that nature. Um, and and so, so what we're seeing is more and more and more and more of these things around the world. And when they do happen, they used to happen occasionally. Now they're happening more frequently. So both the rain, the, the extent is, incre is increasing, as is the intensity and the frequency. Uh, not, ne not necessarily. It could be related, but it's not necessarily the same thing as red tides. Um, so the red tides um, can be, a, so you can see, um, you definitely can see algal blooms that might be associated with this, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Um, so the, the most, the, the classic one was the one right off of the mouth of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River drains about 40% of the continental U.S., and so all those, that farmland up in the Midwest and the fertilizers and the cow poop and the whatever the heck comes down, goes through New Orleans and then goes out and gets dumped out into the Gulf of Mexico, a relatively shallow body for uh, not like what we have here on the West Coast. And so that means that, especially in the summertime, the water doesn't necessarily mix as intensely. And so you can get this accumulation of these substances, which can lead to problems. And so this is the most uh, recent data I have from last year. Uh, and this is, uh, and, and basically the, the darker red, the more problematic. And so for you guys that haven't come with us in New Orleans, here's uh, Lake Pontchartrain. So this is where the, this is the Mississippi River I'm tracing right here. So this is the mouth right here. And so this stuff is dumping out here and, um, and, and causing all of these uh, problems. Another key geography of the ocean you guys should, should at least be aware of is the midwater. So uh, hard to show a picture of the midwater. Um, 
But so this is a picture down deep looking up at a school of fish. Um, but midwater is the largest habitat on planet Earth by far, by orders of magnitude. So if you're an alien, you're coming here to encounter life on Earth, you probably wouldn't look in the air, you probably wouldn't look on land, your first pass would be to look in the water because that's, that, that's, the, that's what most of our planet is in terms of living area. This is what the midwater typically looks like, right? It's dark, most of it's down deep. There is bioluminescence, but, but it's gonna be dark, there's gonna be no sunlight. But there's all kinds of crazy cool critters like this Vampirotuthis um, uh, uh, that uh, live down there. And because it is at the midwater, you can get alien looking crap, right? The model for, for, for alien uh, is a midwater parasite. Uh, the model for many, many of these sort of horror movie kind of Halloween costume things is the midwater because this is a three-dimensional world. You and I are primarily in a two-dimensional world in the sense that gravity is holding us down, so we have to have bones, and our bones have to be so big, our butt has to be this big, our head has to be this shape, and our arms, because we're dealing with gravity, and we're moving across this two-dimensional surface. These guys don't have that constraint, so they can be all kinds of weird shapes. They can have weird appendages. Um, one, of the neatest, one of the neatest critters on the planet, the, the best fishers in the world, siphonophores, um, well, there's all kinds of different ones, but, but basically these guys that can um, fish the area of this side of campus at once with just a bunch of webs and tentacles out in the water column, right? You could never do that on land. So the midwater is an amazingly awesome, cool place, uh, crazy. Some people would say nightmares. I would say like cool dreams and stuff, uh, just amazing, amazing things. That's the midwater. And then there's all kinds of other cool things too in our planet. Um, another important geography uh, element and is in this case, like the Great Barrier Reef, life derived. And this is the so-called deep scattering layer. And so um, I'm illustrating that with this time chart here from um, some of our federal agencies. And so this is, this is let's go, let's, let's start on the, this side of the graph and let's move to the right side of the graph. Okay, so I'm gonna orient you. So this is depth into the ocean. So this is surface of, uh, surface of the ocean. Down here, deep in the ocean, okay. And then, and then the, the, the heatness, the hotness, is the intensity of the signal bounce back. So we first discovered this really when we started using echolocation uh, and putting sounders in the, in, the, uh, in the ocean around the time of World War II and started pinging things and getting signals and using that to figure out where the bottom is. And people started saying, oh my God, the bottom is much shallower than I thought because I'm getting a signal that's bouncing back. Turns out there was so much life in the water column. The air, bl the swim bladders in the fish, the, the shells and the crustaceans, all this stuff just made, made a structure. And so this, these sound waves would bounce back. And so that's how we first discovered this stuff. This deep scattering layer uh, moves every night up and down the planet. It's the largest consistent migration on the planet Earth. Um, but again, it's happening in the ocean, so we don't see it, so we don't think of it. We think about the gazelles and all those, the buffalo and all those cool guys, but, but this, this stuff is amazing. So what's going on here is these are critters that would like to be feeding in the shallow waters where we have a lot of other critters to feed upon, right? A classic example would be a fish, maybe a fish. I really want to go eat that plankton. That plankton, maybe is a phytoplankton, so that phytoplankton is up here by the sun up in the shallow water because that's where the sunlight is and that's where it can photosynthesize and do its deal, right? I'd really love to eat that thing, but maybe if I go up there, a tuna might see me, right? It might want to eat me. So I want to hang out. So I'm going to hang out when the sun is up, I'm going to be down. I'm going to be down deeper in the water. When the sun goes down, I'm then going to go up, move up into that shallow water, feed for a while, and feed until I start to see the sun come up and then I go back down. And so that's what we're showing here. So at night, the scattering layer is close to the surface. Then as the sun comes up, it, it, it drops down on average. There's still some things that hang up here. There's still some, some you know, phytoplankton mm -hmm. stuff, but it drops down and everything's cool. And the sun starts to set and they come back up and boom, boom, boom. Um, uh, so really uh, cool stuff. Um, uh, and, and, and 
it's also abbreviated as uh, daily vertical migration. That's what the DVM stands for. Um, so deep scattering layer, um, incredible biodiversity in the ocean. And, and, and these are the kind of guys that are doing this. These copepods, these other, these other um, zooplankton are, are one of the main constituents of, of the deep scattering layer. Okay, so that was a little bit about geographies. So we talked about near, far, um, terms we maybe haven't heard of, but that might be coming up in our readings as, as the semester progresses. And so I wanted to expose everybody to those. Um, and now we'll start turning to actual management challenges. But before we leave there, I wanted to ask if you all had questions about, maybe from some of the scoop at things that you all have generated recently or some of the papers that we've read, are there any other geographies, either, either terminology or actual places that you've seen referenced in some of our readings so far um, or maybe just heard about in the news that, you, that you're unfamiliar with that you would like to ask about or are wondering about? 